I'm Ian Williams, a trustee for the Griffin Poetry Prize. I'm speaking with Canadian poet Susan Musgrave, author of Exculpatory Lilies and a finalist for the 2023 Griffin Poetry Prize. The book is published by McClelland and Stewart. Um, hi, Susan. Hey, hi, Ian. So this is always a bit hard, right, uh, for poets here. Um, but I want you to try. If you had to describe your collection in a few sentences, how would you describe it? Well, when I write in it for people, I put um, this slim volume of sorrows with, I hope, mm -hmm. a little joy. I don't like the word joy. It's my least favorite word because I had a terrible lodger once called joy. And I had to loop, move out of my own home to escape her so I could never use joy detergent or sing joy to the world or there's a whole poem joy about sex. joy in there what that but there is there's... i hope some light anyway if not mm. but it's a collection of a lot of the poems are for my daughter who died in 2021 and my husband in 2018 so there's mm. there's a lot of grief in the book but um that's just how they came out somebody right. asked me why are there all these poems about your family? Or is it a question from the CBC? And I thought, uh, <laughs> how do we know what comes into our poems? Or they things just come along and you find yourself writing about it. It's not mm. there's no formula. Right. They died within three years of each other, right? Like it was yeah, like, Stephen was 2018 and Sophie was 20, 2021. Right. Yeah, I'm wondering, Susan, here, uh, when we write poems uh, or these kinds of elegies. Um, did you find that it kept them alive and close to you and it kept the pain fresh or did it have this kind of um, cleansing and um, help you process or find resolution? Did it help or hurt is what I'm asking. A bit of both. Um, the poems I wrote called The Goodness of This World, I wrote in 2014 because Sophie was on the street then and she was younger and I just thought she was going to die. And so I was trying to keep her alive for 20 years. She was kind of struggling. And um, so, and then the last one I wrote called Postscript was when I was bringing her ashes home from Vernon. Um, it's the last poem I've written actually. Um, and it's at the end of the section. And uh, it's almost like she died and she took the words away. And she was my muse. I'd been writing about a child that had that was dying since she was born. So I don't know if I was, it was just the worry that all parents have or if, if I was somehow prescient. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I, 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 I couldn't even copy edit that section of the book when, when it was coming out, I'd have to skip over it. I'd say someone else has to copy edit these, read these poems to make sure that I can't do it. And I still notice that when I'm at readings, I flip through that section really fast. I almost like I can't bear it. The, you know what's there um and i remember showing i gave her it was a chat book that um somebody published and i remember giving her a copy thinking she should have these to know well, how much i loved her really it's uh and i love that people can know a little bit about her life not her fate but her life i mean there's that dido song remember me but not my fate and when someone di dies of an overdose particularly there's a stigma to it that people remember she died of an overdose they don't remember the life and I, and I wanted her life to be shared and mm -hmm. and lots of people you know get that and and since so many people have children in the same situation or they're waiting for that phone call that I got it's mm -hmm. it's it's uh it's the you know it's it's a kind of the right time to people need some sort of catharsis or need somebody mm -hmm. somebody to speak for them if they don't write themselves yeah. I mean, you, I want to pick up on something you're saying here, right? Which is, I I couldn't tell which was the stronger force in the collection here. Definitely there's grief, right? I think that's the, the sort of best and simplest way to summarize it. But there's also this force of love here. And it's this tension between love and grief, love and grief. What's the relationship between those things for you? Do you think we can, can we grieve someone that we don't love? Um, or does grief... Or how does love and grief work for you? Well, don't they say, I mean, it's a, it seems to be a common thing that the more you love somebody, the more you grieve. It's, that's mm -hmm. the way it works, apparently. Mm -hmm. So my mother died. I did love her, but she was 93 and didn't want to live. So my grief wasn't, I miss her. You know, I miss not, I wish I could tell her that I, oh, I'm nominated for this award. Because she was always the first to point out war, awards I wasn't nominated for. So this, <laughs> Great. Mom. It's like a mom there. Yeah. <laughs> I told you so, Mom. Who will publish you when you're 40 with wrinkles was her line when I was 25, when my first book came out. I was 21, actually. Mm. So those are things parents say to you, right? That stick in your brain. So mm. um 
it's so great. And I think like when late Princess Diana died, I remember being really for three days feeling a sense of grief. But of course, I didn't know her. Mm. Um, and my husband was annoyed with me. He said, how can you be grieving for someone you don't know? And and I said, well, I don't know. There's she seemed to do good in the world and, and mm. was a, yeah, there's something. I don't know what it was. Maybe the collective grief in the world is, is something that we pick up on. Um, so, and I do, when someone tell, I mean, every day I go on Facebook and find out somebody else I know has died and there's a, it's not the profound, it's almost an illness, the grief I've been feeling for a year and a half. And so I bought a book called the grieving brain, because I figured there's some neuroscience behind this that I'm missing. It's not just, I'm not just sad because Sophie's dead. Something my brain is doing. And it's wonderful because the writer talks about, imagine coming downstairs in the morning and your dining room table has been stolen. It's mm -hmm. not there. The brain can't equate that it doesn't make sense to the brain and it's the same when a person is dead our brain has no previous experience even if we've got experienced death to cope with it it doesn't understand how a person is here one minute mm -hmm. and in another dimension and that's what I, I i notice a lot of people say i go and stand at my wife's grave and say where are you we're mm -hmm. looking for them in this dimension and they're not here and that's the brain so it's my brain it, it has to relearn that she's not here and once i've relearned that and mm -hmm. i think that's happening um, then I can, you know, the dining room table image, if you, if it's stolen, you walk around the space for maybe three weeks where it was. Yeah. I, I love see literal images like that. Cause they help me see what's going on in my brain. Right. And I drive around saying, Sophie, where are you? Where are you? Because right. it just doesn't make sense to me that she's not here. Someone who was so here. And that's what we often say to the dead. They were so much here, so alive. And then mm -hmm. they're so not alive. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just mm -hmm. such a, it's really hard to, to, to deal with that. I mean, I have a kind of aspiring Buddhist practice and the impermanence is something I know about, but I, I sure can't accept it. It's like, no, I don't want this impermanence in my life. Yeah, there's no preparing to... for it. Absolutely. None. Mm -hmm. um, so a little bit about addictions now here. And so um, your daughter passed away from an overdose, but I'm wondering if there's something um, compelling about this for poets. Do you think that we are more prone to... Uh, like obsessive patterns and practices and things that resemble addiction? Um, I think many people are. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of what Stephen used to call OCDC. I think it's ADD, or a, but anyway, OCDC is what mm. I call it. Um, so I guess there are degrees of, yeah. of, again, it's degrees rather than, I don't know, I, who knows what causes people to write poetry. It's Right. Uh, but are I you pretty say... zen about it? Because I get pretty, uh, I get kind of obsessed myself. And I'm, I'm just wondering if that's your habit um, too. I, or no. I used to, as I say, I haven't written a poem. I'm just starting. I've in the last week or two to get mm -hmm. lines that have come into my head and thinking, okay, maybe this is, maybe I just couldn't. Grief was enough of a kind of thing in my life to just live with that and not do anything more. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was, I wouldn't. I, I think also selfishly, I didn't want her to die because I knew how much it was going to hurt. The same with Stephen. I didn't want them to die because I'm going to suffer. <laughs> it was like, mm -hmm. That's not a very good reason not to want someone to die. And of course, I loved them, but I knew that there was going to be such suffering that I didn't really think on her birthday, I spent the day trying um, looking up assisted suicide in Switzerland because I thought I could say goodbye to everybody. And that way, it's not like I'm not doing something messy. I'm going to plan it all. And well, I didn't qualify because I wasn't terminal, but I think that's very judgmental. I mean, if you're really sad, you shouldn't be able to do it. But you're no. suffering. Mm. So I, I took off um, assisted suicide off my bucket list. I don't have a bucket list, but if I had one, that was now it's not on it any longer. Mm. And um, and Sophie also wouldn't want me to be so sad, and that's the thing. But I guess they don't have a choice. I mean, she mm. would not want me to be as and as in as much pain as I've been in. That she wasn't right. like that so and neither would Stephen. they yeah it's a get on with it you know you've got yeah. life to live Susan I'm gonna ask you to read a or share a few lines or read a, a short poem for us but I have to say it's a stunning collection and I can't imagine how difficult it was to write you know there were moments where I went god at it it was it was absolutely stunning would you mind reading a bit for us Thank you. I'll read a poem that's lighter. Um, it's I tend to be a, a kind of a know-it-all person, which really annoys me because I don't want to know it all. But um, Patrick Lane used to say, you know, he'd argue with me and then he'd find out 
that I was right. He'd phone and say, oh, I can't believe it. You're right again. And I, I think I must be wrong. Sometimes I just don't say, if I think I might be wrong, I don't say that I'm right. But anyway, <laughs> this is a poem called The Truth. The hitchhiker I picked up a mile outside of Masset claimed he'd been enlightened by buttercups, so many that to stare at them too hard would have induced blindness. All day he had meditated by the ditch, and the moment I'd pulled over in my Jeep Cherokee, he knew he'd been blessed. He'd been waiting his whole life for someone like me. It crossed my mind to tell him, those were dandelions, not buttercups, but how pleased I am with myself, I refrained. <laughs> That's a quintessential me poem. <laughs> congratulations <laughs> on your self-restraint there. Yeah. Right, congratulations on being a finalist for the Griffin Poetry Prize. Join us on June 7th, uh, where Susan will read some more of her poems at Kerner Hall. I've been speaking with Susan Musgrave, author of Exculpatory Lilies, um, one of this year's finalists for the Griffin Poetry Prize. Thanks, Ian.